This conference will now be recorded. Uh, good evening. My name is Duncan Berry. This is a meeting of the Harwich Planning Board for Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. It is 6.30 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being held via remote participation only. Access is available through gotomeeting.com or live on broadcast channel 18. If you uh, would like to join, please go to the uh, uh, global.gotomeeting.com slash join slash 7023-49325. Or you can dial in at 872-240-3212. Uh, with the access code 702-349-325. And uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in any one place. This meeting of the Harwich Planning Board is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. Shall we take an attendance here? Uh, I'll do the roll call. I guess I am here. Greg Chadwick? Greg Chadwick here. David Harris? David Harris here. Joe McFarland? Joe McFarland here. Mary Maslowski? Mary Maslowski here. Alan Peterson? Hi, Alan. I, I know you're, I can see you, but I can't hear you. Maybe your system is on low. Because you're not mu mu muted either. I still can't hear you. No, can't hear you. That's odd. Can we, can we chat if, if need be or if you need to? Because I get that window open and we can run that. Arthur Rouse. Arthur Rouse here. And Bill Stoltz. Bill is not here. Bill is not here. Okie doke. So it looks like we have no public hearings this evening, and uh, we do have um, some new business, starting with uh, minutes from the October 27th meeting. Has everybody had a chance to look at them? Move to adopt the minutes of October 27th, 2020. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Do I have a second? Craig Chadwick. Looks like I've got Craig Chadwick on the second. Uh, roll call, Duncan Berry, aye. Craig Chadwick. Craig Chadwick, aye. David Harris. David Harris, aye. Joe McFarland. Joe McFarland, aye. Mary Maslowski. Mary Maslowski, aye. Alan Peterson. Alan Peterson, is aye. And Arthur Rouse. Arthur Rouse, aye. Arthur Rouse, aye. And no Bill Stoltz. <clears throat> Uh, second item is the design guidelines discussion, and we have Sarah uh, Korjeff with us here this evening, and um, Ms. Kellum, and I think Charlene will probably want to take it from here. Okay, we are getting some weird feedback from someone. I'm not sure who that is. So, in um, so Sarah and and the group at the commission um, was so so very helpful in coming up with this draft um, design guideline document uh, that you have um, in your packet. And it is um, agenda item Roman numeral 3A21. And this would be in addition to the zoning bylaw that was passed at the annual town meeting in September. And it would provide for um, the purpose of this section and uh, give examples of design guidelines for historic structures, as well as new construction. Um, what would then be created is a separate document that would give specific examples. And um, Duncan did a great job on the second document in your packet. He drafted that uh, based on some conversations that he and I had. Um, 
So if we want to go through the zoning bylaw first, would that be best? Great. Or, or if people have specific questions. So um, the, uh, paragraph A is design guidelines for historic structures. And what we've done here is, is what the goal is, and it's to rehabilitate and renovate historic buildings um, so as to preserve historic architecture. What we're not promoting here is demolition or reconstruction of an existing historic building. Um, and we're saying that that would not qualify under uh, these incentives uh, because it does not preserve the building historic significance. And then we go into um, item two, which is design guidelines for work on historic structures should include these concepts. And um, it goes through um, a renovate, reuse and incorporate historic structures into new new development proposals. So the idea is to utilize an existing building that may be there, either expand on it or build a new building out back, that kind of thing. Um, retain the original roof line and building massing. I'm not gonna read all of these. Um, then it talks about doors and, and features of a structure. Uh, then it moves into design um, any changes or alterations to a historic structure to be reversible so that if there is a change made and later on you, you wanna uh, take an addition off, you won't lose the integrity of the original um, uh, historic structure that was there or any unique architectural features. Uh, locate additions um, on secondary facades, step them back from the original structure, um, so as to limit demolition of original materials. Additions should uh, not require removal or of any distinctive architectural trim or features. Uh, make uh, additions smaller than the historic building to ensure historic the historic structure remains prominent. Um, it talks about uh, if you want to add dormers, how they should be set back to visually be uh, appropriate. Um, then also locate new structures or outbuildings at least uh, 50 feet behind the front facade of the primary historic structure. And then we talked about um, facade fenestration for non-commercial buildings. And um, we have in there right now 35 to 70%. In, in my conversations with Duncan, we both thought that that might be a little bit too big or too much and perhaps maybe 25 to 40%. Um, you know, that's something that I think is, is definitely up for, for discussion. Um, do you want to go through this section by section, Duncan, if anybody has questions on the design guidelines for historic structures? Or if Sarah, yeah, I, do you want to add anything? Let's hear from Dave, Mr. Harris. Yeah, I, uh, I've got a couple of questions and comments on, on uh, page facade fenestration. Is that the minimum or maximum? <laughs> I believe Charlie that Charlie. was a range, right? 30 to 70% of the range. Right. It could be a minimum of 35% to a maximum of 70% as I understand. Okay. It. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Duncan, this is Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi, so just from the historic um, commission standpoint, um, my only fear with the with the design guidelines as a bylaw is that it does have to work together with the demolition delay bylaw. So any of these changes that are going to require anything that is not like for like is going to automatically trigger demolition delay in our current bylaw. So I'm just not sure that it that it sets out that that's necessary. But it, anything that's 100 years or, or older, any demolition, the way ours is drafted, includes you know, the removal of anything that isn't like for like would trigger the demolition delay. I do believe we referenced that in the, I didn't bring the document home, but I believe that we do um, indicate that in a previous section of this bylaw. 
Mary. Okay. I remember talking about it. Yeah, but, but I think, I think we think added that language. language. Yeah. Be, it couldn't be reiterated here somewhere. Right. I think we need to definitely look into that. Um, Ms. Korchev, I see your hand is raised. Great, thank you. I just wanted to make a comment, and I agree with the most recent point that it makes sense to reiterate the um, the interaction with the demos and delay bylaw in this section also. Um, but I also wanted to specifically mention that section 2.8 about facade mitigation. I think you might want to consider leaving that for the part of the guidelines that talks about new construction because Generally, when we're talking about the administration of a historic building, you want to keep what's there. Um, and this is really, I believe, about the appropriate amount of windows on the facade of the structure. I had some difficulty understanding what you said. I'm so sorry. I think no. it's just my. Yeah. We were it was getting garbled feedback, for everybody. From Mary, and she has now okay. muted. So I'll, I'll try one more time. <laughs> um, so first of all, I think it makes sense to reiterate the connection with the demolition delay bylaw in this section, but also um, part H, which deals with the facade fenestration. I believe that's really intended to address new construction with historic buildings. Obviously we wanna preserve the existing historic window pattern and, and scale. So it might be more appropriate to move that section H down into the design guidelines for new construction. I Thank believe you, Sarah, that's an excellent point. I think point. what we did is that the um, way it was set up was that there was a, a smaller surface uh, fenestration for historic and it was granted larger for new material so that or for, for new additions. Um, here at, you'll see in section B E two is where they had 50 to 90%. And our conversation was that would have been wildly in, uh, congruous with buildings that had maybe a maximum. I mean, remember the historic buildings that we're looking at pre 1920, let's say 1820 or 1720. Maximum surface area might have been 25% this is prior to uh, industrial manufacture of glass, you know, in the 1850s and 60s. So it was just like having a hole in the building. So the idea that there would be so much in the newer would be completely out of keeping. So um, do you think it, so are you saying, Sarah, that it should be just simply taken out of section A? That would be my recommendation. Um, I think I think it makes more sense when you're talking about historic structures to look at the individual building and its existing fenestration uh, rather than to actually place limits on it. Yep, that makes Elena, sense. Can we hear from the planning director about these changes? Yes. I, I did run through all the, them all. I think it is appropriate that we do reiterate the um, demo delay bylaw, um, and that easily can be fit in here. Um, and there is a suggestion that for uh, historic structures, we actually remove uh, the guideline for fenestration for non-commercial buildings, and I, I agree with that. Um, we do have it under the commercial buildings, um, as Duncan said, under B2E, number two, and we can definitely discuss that more when we get to that section. Now, in the meantime, Charlene, uh, if I understand correctly, you think that we should take uh, A2H and amend it from 35 to 70% to 25 no, to 40%? I'm saying we should delete H altogether. Based okay, on I understand. So Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we delete no, you don't paragraph. Motion. You don't, don't, no motions yet. No, we're, we're only discussing. This is a, a, a thing in progress. You don't, you don't need we're to. Not gonna adopt, we're not going to adopt it tonight? No. no. 
Thank you. Okay. At least that wasn't the idea. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Crack, Mr. Chadwick. Thank you. Um, is following up on Joe's uh, question about adoption of this document, uh, will this be something that we will eventually uh, vote on and adopt and will it then have to go to town meeting or was the, the approval that we had, we're good to go and now we do our own thing? No, no, this would have to go on the, the board would have to approve it and refer it to the board of selectmen for them to refer it back to hold the public hearing process. And then it would be on the annual town meeting warrant when, when that hopefully please let it be next Meg. Right. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Was originally this was going to be a potential sticky wicket for uh, conversation in the material that we did for the um, for the September 26th town meeting. So that's why we split this one off to try and handle it separately because, you know, percentages and everything like that, then people's the hair on people's back gets up and just wanted to avoid that whole scenario. That's why I think the idea of having a couple of drafts here, especially so graciously um, um, on Charlene's part that she agreed to continue with this conversation make sure that we get this you know, in place before her departure in T minus how many days are we looking at Charlene? Well, it's it's T minus, I think we're in the 17. However, if you did not hear, um, this Blackman did approve a contract for me to come back um, starting the week of September 7th as the interim town planner. And I would be working approximately 15 hours a week and it's a 90 day contract. So you haven't totally lost me yet, but. Okay. Okay. There was a piece in today's paper about it. Yep. <clears throat> I don't, I don't get the paper. So, oh boy. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, it's Craig. That's yes, sure. Thank you. Um, so following up on that conversation, will this at some point, once we kind of do our tweaking and we're, we're comfortable with it, is it something that would go to an attorney for review? And the reason that I'm asking is there are some things in here that are very, um, I guess, broad or general. Uh, for instance, uh, item A to F regarding uh, new dormers and they should be set back from all edges of the roof by several feet. And if I'm a builder or somebody that's looking at this, um, my several feet interpretation might be different than Charlene's definition. So how, I guess I'm looking for what the process is as we make this, get this thing to work. Because this was done under the um, commission's uh, district of critical planning concern um, provision that, that they have under the Cape Cod commission, we have a little more leeway with these bylaws than we would under normal uh, zoning bylaws. We have that, that wiggle room to be a little bit more creative than, uh, than chapter 40A section five allows us to be for zoning amendments. We also, in part with this, would be creating a document um, that would be used as a, as a visual design guideline that would give people examples of what we were talking about. You know, real examples from the district of, or illustrations of what we're talking about. I hope that helps. Uh, Dave Harris, can I, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Harris. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Craig that, that a lot of these are very subjective and and it's uh, it's a little difficult to figure out exactly how whether you've uh, complied or not. And uh, uh, I want to point out that there are resources that will help here. How exactly we incorporate them or reference them is another matter, but Back in the 80s, HUD developed a set of rehab guidelines that addressed walls, windows, roof, uh, the fire ratings of archaic materials and all that, which would help the builder relate to the current code. 
they were republished or redeveloped in the uh, in, in the uh, about 15 years ago, uh, and they're available on HUD's website. The original ones, I think, are pretty much lost, except for a few of us that have copies. And they got into uh, how you, how and when you can use sandblasting on on archaic materials, and their purpose was to uh, to maintain and protect archaic materials and structures. Uh, and I, in reading this, I know that's something that we we this document really embraces. Uh, another question I have is: Are we going to address issues like solar panels, uh, satellite dishes, signage, and that, or will we be relying essentially on the existing criteria in in the uh, town code to address those, and they will apply here as they would in other buildings? Right now, signage is under the existing bylaw. Okay. Um, as far as solar, um, as long as the, um, you know, if, if I don't know if solar would, would trigger historic review, um, but I don't know if there'd be anything prohibiting solar being put on any structures unless the board wanted to. I, I would not be a proponent for that myself. Um, certainly it could be on new construction, but, uh, cause that was one thing that was asked on the, on the field of town meeting, not the floor, but the, the ball field is if this was going to prohibit, um, solar. And the answer at that point was no, that was not the intent to, to prohibit solar. I wasn't talking about prohibiting. I was talking about, uh, providing guidelines where it would be more tastefully done. I, as I recall, we didn't we provide for uh, solar panels um, that were not facing the street in the original language? Mm, I don't believe I remember did. that. We we talked about that, but you know, we need to we need to consider the functional Even aspects of solar panels too. Right. I, I don't believe there was any discussion in in any of the documents that have been approved so far at town meeting. Um, regarding oh, no, it was it was it was during discussion during the meeting. It wasn't related to content of the documents. I mean, that's certainly again, that's certainly something that can be put into this this uh, uh -huh. the guidelines that would be drafted um, as examples of what would be appropriate and what wouldn't be appropriate. Um, Sarah Duncan, um, Liz, and I, and and other folks at the commission have looked at at least a do a dozen different communities um, uh, design guidelines to look at, you know, how they put them together, what seemed to work better, um, what we thought was, was a better document than others. So, you know, that's another document that will be drafted. That won't be part of the zoning bylaw. That will be a separate like rules and regs document that the board would approve at a town, at a, um, it would be a public hearing. You'd have a public hearing on it and then you would adopt those guidelines. So assuming that this went through the town meeting concurrently, you would be also adopting those guidelines. You actually will have a little bit more uh, time to work on that um, than you do the zoning bylaw to get that to the selectmen to get the process going for the town meeting. Um, so you will have a little more wiggle room um, an ability to draft those guidelines. This is Dave again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I mentioned the rehab guidelines, the, the two versions or editions of them. Is that something that we could reference in, in any of these documents in a way that will uh, provide uh, information to the uh, applicants that they there are some uh, documents that would be beneficial and helpful to them? Certainly in, in the separate document that the, t that the board would be adopting, you can reference other documents. There's two documents okay. that the commission has drafted that I think um, we would also want to, you know, uh, reference as another document source available. Okay. The other thing is to, to bear in mind, uh, Dave, is that if you look at the second document, uh, Roman numeral three dash A dash two, Dot two, um, 
section two of that document has alteration standards and um, considering the language that you're using, it looks like, could somebody put mute on with the background for me? Um, the standard section two of that has, uh, I, I saw it. All, I think some of the stuff you're talking about, that's condensed from a document that probably derived from your HUD standards. And I-, I Possibly. And this was one of those 12 or 18 um, uh, New England uh, guideline, uh, design guideline documents that we've been in review with in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, thank you. Have to add to that, Ms. Korjaf? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to add one thing. Thank you. That the intention of uh, this sort of outline, if you will, that um, is the first document in your packet was to identify the different issues and sort of design concepts to be addressed in the design guidelines. It wasn't meant to be, um, uh, that it wasn't meant that this would necessarily be the final word on everything. So um, the extent that you want to add more detail to this uh, before recommending that it be adopted as part of the, the zoning for the district. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I just, I think we just tried to lay out the issues that should be covered mm -hmm. and, and we thought we'd have some time to actually fill in the details. Right. Thank you. I think another thing to consider is that we want people, if, if I get this right, um, Charlene, I think we're trying to get people to triangulate between the design guidelines and the standards and the um, application of those as they exist both in the village, in the town, in the county, and in the state. So there's kind of like a concentric thing that we would look at, for instance, um, we want to make sure that we're using something that uh, a, a principle that makes sense and then to see how that principle is applied in material that people can actually see. So the conversation then becomes focused on what's appropriate and, and regarded as uh, appropriate to the law and appropriate in usage. Well said. Okay. And, and uh, Dave, I think it was standard seven on that second document that gets into surface cleaning. Gentlest means possible with the material there. Uh, that's uh, reading that was what triggered my comments. Thanks. Ah, okay. Do you I, want I, me to in reading to... that, Duncan? In, in reading that, I couldn't I couldn't help but think that a hundred years from now there'll be a similar document and they'll be talking about us <laughs> that's right there will be we can bank on it uh, do you want me to go on to the design guidelines for new construction please so we also part b of the proposed zoning amendment um, would be to provide guidelines for new construction and um, what the goal there is to enhance and preserve the architectural and cultural uh, community character of the district, the dimensional regulations pursuant to uh, the previous uh, bylaw that's already been approved, and and how how to you know really fit a, a new building or new construction um, in with the the feeling of the existing uh, district. Um, and some of the elements that should be looked at is appropriate scaling of buildings. And what I what I forgot to send to you is um, Liz at the commission actually did a um, a document, um, which I I forgot to put in your packets, and I apologize. Which shows um, a massing kind of exercise for existing buildings and new buildings. And I will share that with you. I'll make sure you get a copy of that. But I think it, it was a good visual representation of, of you know, what works or how it could work. Um, so the second is appropriate from building setback. And we talked about that a little bit um, in the prior section, appropriate roof forms for the district, 
you know, keeping a roof pitch that's in keeping with existing architecture um, and existing primary roof forms, um, appropriate facade widths that would be in keeping with um, and, and be consistent with the existing patterns in the area. And then we do talk about um, uh, facade uh, transparency and windows, appropriate amount of windows on the facade, uh, finished, uh, facade fenestration for commercial buildings. We have 50 um, to 90% to incorporate uh, display windows. Might be a little bit too much, um, perhaps a little bit lower. Um, appropriate building entrance locations. Um, appropriate building materials, you know, wood siding, clapboard, or shingles. Um, we, we really would not prefer to have vinyl siding and aluminum or brick or a brick face. Um, appropriate use of screen parking, which is already in the regulations or in the bylaws and um, the use of fencing uh, and or landscaping to help define edges of, of new development. Mr. Chairman, Joe McClellan. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, can we ask uh, Charlene, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to make some of these changes and, uh, you know, to redraft this document and, and insert those changes, uh, including um, the, the ones about, uh, you know, the, the amount of facade fenestration uh, and... Bear with me here. Oh, there was a second one. Oh, I see it. Uh, uh, on the second page, that th the paragraph E2, where she suggests that instead of 50 to 90, it's ought to be 35 to 50. Can we have her put those changes into a new draft? Well, if everybody agrees, I can do whatever you all want, but... <laughs> I think there needs to be some consensus from the board as to what would be preferable. I agree, Charlene. And but, Mr. Chairman, if it, if if you need it, uh, I'd make a motion. No, 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 no motions. <laughs> no motions. It's, okay. It's too, it's too early for motions, Joe. This is a discussion uh, only at this point. Like an editorial conversation. I mean, this is the very first time you. I, I understand. I. Yeah, I understand all that. My my concern is that at some point we're going to lose our planning director, and and I don't want to have to go back and redo all of this material from the get go with the new planning director. Joe, you're not losing me till at least March. Right. Oh, because you'll work part time. I understand. Okay. Yeah. We're trying and, to get this done, you know, in three weeks before Christmas. Christmas. That's that's the focus of my work. Right. But in the meantime, I have a question. Go Let's ahead. No, no, let Joe finish his uh, comments. No, I, I just to say, in the meantime, you're, you're only going to be there, whatever it is, a few days a week, right? I'll, I'm going to be there two days a week, but my primary work will only be planning board stuff, including what we're working on right now. I understand. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Harris. Uh, yeah, they're on, uh, on appropriate building materials. Uh, in recent years, there's been a number of, of, of uh, new materials uh, that have been approved by building codes and things like that. And one of the, one of the uh, PPC is being used for trim. Yes. Because it doesn't rot. Uh, yep. And I'm, I'm assuming that this is going to allow that sort of thing. You know, I, I agree we don't want to use aluminum or PVC siding, uh, but uh, I don't. There are some uh, new materials uh, that really would be beneficial. So I just want to make sure we uh, we cover that appropriately. Again, I think this is. 
Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Um, but just to follow on to what, what Dave said, even um, siding nowadays, I think there are a lot of composite materials out there that uh, you or I probably couldn't even tell the difference. We would think it, you know, it's uh, wood, you know, cedar siding. Uh, it's so well made and and I don't know what the right word is, but how do we incorporate that? And I guess a follow up follow on question to that is eventually once we've agreed on everything, let's say everything's accepted, the uh, it's been approved by town meeting, is the enforcement officer, for lack of a better word, the building inspector that in that, let's use that as an example, a composite material instead of a wood uh, clapboard or something else if that's if we do approve that uh, who's the one that makes the determination that that composite material fits our desires for the guidelines of this con new construction you would the board would. in the review process they would have to show what they are are building their additions or what what have you out of so they would so need you would have the ability to review the materials that would be utilized. So they'd physically come into a, assuming we can all meet in the same room with a sample of the composite siding or something, whatever they wanted to use to show us as the enforcement body that that meets our requirements. You're the approval body, not the enforcement body. Or, uh, sorry, approval. And could I just, as an addition here, again, if you look at the second document, section two, standard six, this idea of these alteration standards are kind of a series of cascading trade-offs and decisions. So it gives you an optimal choice, the next choice, as well as a rationale for the selection that I think that provides the basis for the conversation with us about the design standard that the the uh, homeowner wants to use or the business owner wants to use so again it's a way of structuring the conversation mr harris i know you have your hands up sorry yeah the, the uh the, there'd be two approval levels here one the planning board and then of course the building official the building official follows a, a, a nationally national program of notice of, of acceptance of materials that comply with fire regulations and structural requirements and so on. Uh, we want to make sure that th this, this complies with our objectives and intent with respect to historic preservation. So, uh, and, and the code official would probably be the, uh, the entity that would enforce what we require when we grant a permit. Is that the way you see it, Charlene? Absolutely. I mean, any design that is done has to meet the, the building code standards. So any designer architect who's going to be presenting plans, um, hopefully will know that and will know what what will be appropriate when, and what won't be. Now, what would be new to them is the requirements of the planning board with respect to the design guidelines. Uh, and, and so my question really is, will we be able to uh, uh, rely on the code official to enforce that, what we approve? In your approval, whether in your approval, it would be referencing the plans that were approved. The building plans, the site plan, all get referenced in the decision. So it's incumbent upon the applicant to submit those approved plans to the building commissioner. Okay. But the building commissioner also has an enforcement arm. They inspect the process, the, the, uh, the building as it's being built. Would the building code official enforce our requirements in so far as they go over and above the code officials requirements from the building code? As long as it's not counter to the building code. Oh, that that approved plan is what has to be built and approved by the building commissioner through the review and, and um, permitting process. Okay, thank you. Does it, if I might ask, 
does the building inspector have like a building inspector commission or something? Why am I thinking he has two or three guys, or two or three, not necessarily guys, but two or three people who, who are part of his commission? There's a building commissioner, there is a local inspector, and we have a part-time local inspector now. Arthur, okay, yeah. but what about, if, if I might, Charlene, uh, is my memory any good? Doesn't Dr. Dalgallo sit on one of those committee commissions? I honestly don't know who that is, so I, I can't comment. Okay, all right. I'll check that out, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Duncan, Duncan this is Mary. Hi, Mary. You got to go? No, no. Okay, good. Have a comment. Please. Uh, okay, so just wanted to point out one thing. The Historic Commission is, has been uh, attempting to redraft its demolition delay bylaw. And one of the things that we have asked um, that we're reaching out to the administration on before we kind of finalize our draft of the demo delay is to have the building inspector actually do an inspection post demolition pre construction before he issues the building permit uh, so that we can ensure that the only thing that's getting demolished is what we've kind of allowed in our demolition delay um, approvals. I'm not so sure that kind of a similar step wouldn't be appropriate here because you're talking the same thing as far as, you know, periodic inspections to determine what the materials are that are being used and confirm that those materials are are what there's what they've been approved for so just wanted to throw that two cents worth in and also just um comment if we could um would it be appropriate uh, i'd like to see this get referred to the historic commission only because they've been doing a ton of work with guidelines in our historic district and as it relates to these um, houses that will be subject to the demo delay, uh, they may have some good input um, over and above what we've already kind of started with. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'd love to know if we can share some of your language too, so we can, if there's a, a way to bone up and make sure that we're kind of mutually reinforcing the set of documents here. Uh, that we're all working and we're all moving along the same lines. Is that something that has to be done in a formalized way or can we share privately? Um, I, I don't mean privately, but as a member of both boards, can you bring sure. in a document? So we can, um, we can certainly, right, we can have, we can take them at a meeting and, and address them at the meetings as, you know, as it comes up. So I'd be more than happy to put this on one of our agendas. Um, I think we're already posted for our next one, um, but I know the group would love to kind of chime in on this part and I'm happy to send you what we've already got drafted on um, as far as draft guidelines and draft, um, the new draft of the demo delay bylaw. Mary, do you have a meeting in November or it's the next one? Excuse me. December. I have one. I have one next week. Okay, so perhaps for your December meeting, um, you all could uh, review this. Yeah. Arthur, sorry for taking so long. That's okay, not a problem, um, Mr. Chairman. I just had a. Um, I know that uh, Craig was uh, reiterating about um, the building materials. Um, I, I think it, it would be beneficial if it was really spelled out what can be used and what can't be used, you know, to take that questions out. You were talking about so many variables, you know, they also make a hardy plank board, which is almost like a cement board. You know, they make um, shakers that are made out of, out of, you know, plastic now. I think right. it'd be easier for builders and architects if it was spelled out a little bit more of what can and can't be used. That might I would support that. There, that might be appropriate in the separate document, but not in the zoning bylaw. I don't think you want to be that specific in the zoning bylaw amendment, which is what you're reviewing right now. But I do agree that you may want to have a little bit more specificity in, in the actual um, separate document. Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, on, on, that, so good so on, that, on that on that comment, uh, on Arthur's comment, and on the uh, design guideline guideline standard six, it says the new material should match the material being replaced in composition, design, color, texture, and other visual qualities. Uh, now I would like to delete the composition because if you're replacing something fine. Yep, though. <laughs> We're still talking about the zoning amendment. I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't understand. There, you had two documents that you were provided. We're still on document number one. Okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll, no, I'll hold okay. that till we get to number two. We, we've referenced number two a little bit in, in you know, continuity, but we're not really on that one yet. Um, when okay. last- but I, think the, I think the point that you're making though is that we don't want to have to have a zoning bylaw amendment in front of the town law meeting every time there's a new technology or a new exactly. building material. And exactly. that's why we can be a lot more flexible in the, the standards that we have as opposed to the design uh, the actual design guidelines in the zoning language. Exactly. But what, so what one material that we want to discuss with regard to the design guidelines? Just um, some guidance on um, on E two facade fenestration for commercial buildings. What yes. minimum and to maximum? Sarah, do you have any any thoughts on this? Charlene, I would um, I don't have the correct percentages on the top of my head, but what I would be happy to do is take a look at some downtown areas on the Cape that do have specific percentages and maybe just um, return those to you and for your consideration that for example i know orleans has a has a fenestration percent requirement and um and hyannis does and and maybe if i just uh spell them out for you you could then consider them as a board and decide what's most appropriate for this area sounds perfect thank you i'd appreciate it if we could see it somebody could send it to us these these various other ones Get when I get it, Joe. Thank you. Greg, I can see you've got your hand raised. Sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is there um, something that we can follow or help us to determine what the the right answer is is here in regards to the other areas in Harwich which have, I would assume, these types of guidance and i'm thinking specifically in mary that maybe this is a question for you i know you're uh, heavily involved in the harwood center what is it the 7-eleven building and um the um you know what the windows are on the main street side um and also the the new building um across from the tight shop uh, the, i forget the name of that but that has the uh, sort of the deli and whatever commons. Could the commons, thank you. Um, I just, as I recall, driving down the street, it seems to me that those windows there are, you know, huge almost the entire facade, front facade. And I know that um, we have, I think that's a, a special district, um, Harwich Park. No. Not a, we'll the only historic district in the town is Harwich Center. Okay. But they, so to answer your question, yes, the Historic Commission did work with the builder, the developer, when they were kind of going with their plans and told them what we liked and what we didn't like. And what we were trying to do was finalize the more formal guidelines. Um, that people can look towards when they're, you know, preparing applications to come before their historic commission, uh, the HGHC. But um, that's the building that we were able to have some input in with the building in Harwich Court was the planning board and we really couldn't address aesthetics in the street planning board 
zoning style because you're not allowed to. That's what makes this special district unique. What Mary just said. <laughs> <laughs> so is that similar, Mary, to um, what we're looking at here uh, for West Harwich, similar to the uh, Harwich Center um, design guidelines that you employed for the 7-Eleven building? Or is there nothing? Is there nothing now that spells out uh, what that is, and and you just work with the builder, and they were accommodating to, you know, meet what you folks on the historical commission decided you like best. So more the latter. We're working. We're working on finalizing more of our guidelines. We do have guidelines, but they're not um, as beefed up as you know they perhaps could be and should be um but yes in a historic district the historic commission has a certificate of appropriateness so we have the ability to determine whether a plan is appropriate for the historic district so we have the right to discuss aesthetics when an application comes in the the it's similar in that yes there are the design guidelines would would be similar but it's still different because the planning board isn't going to have kind of a, a certificate of appropriateness application that's going to come through when when an applicant's applying for a building permit in the district of critical planning concern so it's another whole it's another whole level of review that the historic commission gets in a historic district that the planning board still wouldn't have in in kind of the district of critical planning concern and that's why the guidelines are so important because the guidelines need to spell out spell it out because there isn't another permitting review to go through in my own opinion and charlene you can correct me if i'm wrong well under the dcpc the board does have review um approval for a design so unlike anywhere else under zoning you, you're right mary they we we can't <laughs> aesthetics at all but in the dcpc and that's why we're going through this is that there is that flexibility to have um aesthetic review design review um for projects that would be done in this in this district so i get so charlene i get that is it going to rise kind of to the, the level of an equivalent of a, a certificate of appropriateness that we would do in historic um i i think it would be because it would be through the site plan review so okay. as part of, yeah as part of the special permit okay. process through site plan review you will have that ability okay and just as an aside one of the things that we were talking about is this is a great opportunity for uh west harwich to hammer out some concepts that then can be applied elsewhere as other districts um, self-organize in other villages in the town uh, and also provide a template in other towns that they may see as some wor worthwhile language that doesn't exist right now in the county. So, so are we, I think what we want to do is um, get to regroup. We've got plenty of notes here to work on getting a second draft together. Um, why don't we do that in the meantime um, and uh, shall document one or move on to document two, if that's okay, if we have any uh, bandwidth for that kind of a move here. Is that okay? Yep. And uh, we did get the answer to um, Mr. McParland's question. Um, Ron uh, Del Delgallo is on the Board of Health. Yeah, but in addition, he's on some kind of a commission with the building inspector, but on, he's the Board of Health rep on that commission, and uh, shame on me, I can't remember what the heck the name of the other outfit is. I'll, I'll get it. Next time we meet, I'll know. Okay, Dave, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I assume on the first document, the one document we're on now, that item F can be expanded a little bit to prevent the, uh, to, to allow composite materials, contemporary materials. Just want to confirm that. 
This is a draft. This is a working document. You can do whatever you want with it. So you would, you would amend paragraph F to add that language? Yeah, it's just, you know, it says appropriate building materials, wood siding. Is that the only thing you're allowed to use? Is that, is that's the implication. I, I'm just, maybe I'm misinterpreting it. I don't know. Perhaps it would just make sense to take out the wood siding and just say appropriate building materials. Oh, I, I agree. And somebody's going to have to design appropriate. So if, there's, if you have other edits, please email us and let us know what we need to um, to have on there. Uh, we'll work up draft two for design guidelines. All right, I, I can I can send. Uh, you want me to send that to Charlene? Yes, that'd be great. Okay, we'll do. Mr. Barry. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say that one possible way of handling the, the materials question would be to state recommended materials or preferred materials, which could be wood shingles and clavers and other materials that approximate those traditionally used, something like that. So you've at least got some guidance in that line item, but you don't have a definitive statement as to exactly what materials would be allowed or not allowed. Yeah, and we can always add as approved. Right. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next item, which is the second document, um, which is again, this is another draft. The idea having that we would essentially for the guidelines, this is more kind of the interpretive uh, material that allows people to take a look more specifically at the conditions that obtain in the, in the special district. So using language from similar design guidelines and examples from buildings and illustrations, photographs of actual buildings. <clears throat> what we want to do is establish with this document um, in section one kind of uh, description of what it is that's uh, important and what makes it a special district. Section two is the actual standards to, to follow for changing an existing structure. For section three would be the application of the similar kind of standards for the creation of additions and new construction. And then section four would be kind of like a, a guidebook to showing uh, illustrations of all the different architectural components that are involved in uh, comparable, tasteful extensions of what it is that you're dealing with. For instance, you wouldn't put up a glass box abutting you know, with 99% glass surface uh, right next to a uh, circa 1790 cape, you know, single cape. Um, and then it would be finished with a glossary. Um, the way we've seen these things done, there's, uh, uh, be happy to share. Um, we've got great examples, again, thanks to Charlene and to Sarah for calling probably about a dozen or a dozen and a half uh, examples. One of the most interesting uh, in terms of uh, using local examples was the Dennis Port model. Um, but there are also other examples that show illustrations of more kind of geometrical illustrations uh, showing massing, the location of structures on a, on a plot of land, um, setbacks, how these are illustrated with uh, uh, shading and outlining. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to create a rich document for future builders and constructors here. And um, this is going to be a very exciting project creating this document. And as I understand from Charlene, that we're going to have the benefit of some of the input from the Cape Cod Commission in doing some of the graphic work uh, in simplifying these standards and illustrating them with uh, CGI techniques. 
Yes, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, Duncan, I, I really, I really like your outline. I think it covers it, uh, everything. Uh, there, you know, there's a couple of things I comments on, but uh, I just want to compliment you on it. And uh, would it be appropriate to add after the glossary of references? Absolutely, that would be great. And it will be something that we can add to as well. Um, so that people when we have new literature, um, people can refer to what's going on. By the way, that historical description and material is 10 times longer than it needs to be. And it was taken and um, kind of partially edited by me from some of the work that Deirdre Brotherson did like 20 or 30 years ago. So if I want to compress this down so somebody could sit and read this in one sitting and say, aha, this is what we ought to be doing. And I get it or something, you know, put it into that. Are there any recommendations that you would make, Ms. Korjeff, um, to make this a more user-friendly document? What, um, things that you might want to point us to or give us some homework? <laughs> well, I think it's an excellent start. And I think one of the most important things really is setting the stage special about West Harwich. And I think you've got all the information you need to sort of lay out what are the unique architectural forms and details that are there. So I, I think that's a really key part. I, I think beyond that, when you actually get to section two and three, where you're talking about specific, the specifics really from uh, from what from the first document that we were discussing, that's where you'll really benefit from some graphic illustrations to support all the, the text that you have there, and and that's where I think the Cape Cod Commission we're we're prepared to help you. Um, Liz Kellum, my colleague, who's also online listening today, um, has um, done some excellent graphics for us, and uh, and I think we're prepared to to put some time into developing some to support this project for the for the town of Harwich. That's wonderful. One of the things I a question I have for you is that some of the material that we've been looking at, there's some interesting examples of one page summaries. Do you think this is something that we ought to be going after? Because we could definitely work, we could definitely use help on producing something that's, you know, compact and um, very easy, you know, easy to use. Mm -hmm. Or is that just, should, should we avoid that and, and, you know, start with something large and then work toward that later on? Well, my own experience shows that those briefer descriptions of design guidance and those sort of um, one page summaries that are heavy on graphics that they're easier for for people generally to understand and they often tend to get uh, used a little bit more so so I actually think if if your board is comfortable with that format I would strongly recommend it uh, I'd say that of all the more recent design guidance that I've seen um, that seems to be the trend to go towards uh, more graphically illustrated and sort of short and sweet. And when it comes to the text and, and to the point, really. Um, and I think given your unique situation here where you're developing design guidelines for a special zoning district. Um, it, it may benefit you even more to keep it brief um, because I, I think it's somewhat different from a a chapter 40c historic district where maybe people are expecting um, the design guidelines to be more lengthy and, and, and detailed. Great. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Gentleman Carlin, I, I would just ask if these folks could try to shrink this down a little bit. I just went, I've, I've read it before tonight, but it's like four and a half pages and I, I just single space that's an awful lot of material yeah that's is there any part boil it down about 90 percent it's yeah uh, i i, I think a lot, most of it but i just want to make sure we have everything in there you know if if there come a point we're going to edit this down and somebody may say you know what you're missing this point so i thought we'd start with the fattest part of the funnel before we get to the narrowest part well, somebody will probably say that no matter what we do, but that's the old cynic in me. 
Anything else? This is the history. This is the history of where we've been, and, and we, you need to know that in order to go where you want to go. Right. I agree. I agree. I just think we've got to work on cutting it down a little bit. That's all. Absolutely. No, no, I agree. I agree. It can be condensed. Mr. Chairman, it's Craig. Hi, Craig. Um, I agree with everything that everybody said so far, and, and I found the the reading, the narratives, kind of the historic, I guess it's called the historical narrative, very interesting. Um, but as I was reading it, I was thinking it was really, really, really delving into a lot of detailed history, which I found interesting. Um, somebody else may not, and I, I went back to the kind of say, well, what is this document supposed to do? And it's providing design guidelines. It's good to have the history as a foundation for, as I think Dave just said, you know, where were we and where are we heading? Um, but I wonder if the history, historical narrative should be a sort of separate addendum or brochure or something like that that could be made a part of this um, or an, an addition to this rather than it doesn't look like a design guideline to me if i'm reading about you know something that caleb chase did in 1824 that doesn't help me if i'm a builder or or an architect in saying how do i have to build this building I think it needs to go. I agree. I agree. I think it needs to go down to one paragraph, Dave. Well, I, I think if you uh, include some illustrations or photographs of existing buildings, it would greatly improve it for the purposes that Craig was just talking about. That it kind of misses the mark for now. Right. Well, I think there's also a, a parallel document that's going to be developed by the Historical Society, which is kind of like a walking tour. So there'll be illustrations of each one. And so that is a separate exercise, I think. And um, just sure. to have this material here, that can be used hand in glove, I think, with what we need to get accomplished. But um, that, that's probably not the, the, uh, the place where a design guideline is an overview of the architecture but it would be as you say dave having a reference section say please refer to the 2021 Powerwich historical you know exactly you know brochure or whatever <clears throat> So I would recommend, what I'll recommend is that we um, call, uh, work on a second draft with this, um, compressing this historical narrative by 90% or 95% um, and filling out the new construction standards. That's where we're gonna have to get some of the granularity we're talking about with material substitutions. Um, and um, I think the other thing is, is that we can work on also is, uh, uh, if anybody has any ideas or familiarity and wants to work on it with me, this um, section four, where we can talk about things like soffits and brackets and columns and pilasters and returns and what have you, just so that you know there's a difference between a cube and a you know articulated you know classical structure with like looking over uh, Craig's shoulder with a uh, you know a pier with moldings and an abacus and an echinus and an architrave and all the rest of it. You know, there's a language there and just make sure that people know that it's there. So, and they probably see that better in pictures than they do in, you know, words. So anything else we've got here? So I think then we have, um, uh, if that's closed off, do we have any old business? On Just the agenda. Stick it around. <laughs> okay. Congratulations on the profile, by the way. And the chronicle. That was great. Well, you had that beautiful picture and the whole thing I was last Thursday. Oh, I loved your quote though. I have front to say. page. Front page. Did you ever write the letter, Duncan? Hmm? Did you ever write the letter? I, I have a letter, to talk about? I, I, oh, thank you. That was one of the things I wanted to say. 
because the day after we had our meeting and we recommended writing a letter, uh, I heard from, uh, I believe it was Stephen Ford, that they were already in the process of doing and actually eventually enacted what we requested, which is an extension and, uh, you know, kind of getting it on the fast track. But so I kind of take it that they already had it in hand. If that is something you would like me to do additionally, you know, to if there's any update to that, I think I think we're good with that because I spoke with. I think Steve. Sounds, sounds like it's on track to me. Yeah, I think it is. I spoke to three of the uh, selectmen that next morning. They're like, oh, yeah, we're we know what's going on. So it seemed like a formality. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, Mary Mass, would you be kind enough to call me in the morning? Not tonight, but tomorrow morning. You got to unmute. If she's her. still on. She's here. She's got to unmute. She may have backed away from the phone for a second. I can see I'm her. here and I hear you, and I will call you in the morning, Joe. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Uh, Mary, do you have anything else for us? We're now at the reports and briefings. Do you have anything from the historical, any updates for us on that? I really don't. We, um, we've started the CPC reviews and uh, we have a few applications coming before historic in the next, at the next meeting and then the meeting following um, next month for uh, applications. The CPC review has started. So if anyone's interested to please uh, feel free. We'll be meeting frequently, and uh, I don't have the total number of applications off the top of my head or the amounts um, yet. But I will. I can certainly report back that at our next meeting. Looks like the Brooks Academy is going to be the uh, asteroid that impacts the surface of the budget. Probably a million bucks for the for the foundation. Probably. Well, that's what they're seeking. About that kind of impact. So, be interesting to follow. Okay, do we have any more uh, business before the board? Just one quick Motion thing. Just um, Duncan and, and Sarah, we had talked about you, the three of us hanging on at the end um, okay. after the meeting, but I'm thinking we don't need to do that. That's fine. Whatever you guys need, we can uh, circle back and uh, have an email uh, to follow up if you'd like. Okay. Um, with edit it, edits and what have you. If that works. Very good. We have, uh, I think I heard a beginning of a motion from Mr. McFarland. I make a motion, Wager. Looks like Mr. Chadwick is giving us a second. Second. Craig Chadwick, uh, second. So we've got a roll call here. Duncan Berry, aye. Craig Chadwick. Craig Chadwick, aye. David Harris. David Harris, aye. Joe McFarland. Joe McFarland, aye. Mary Maslowski. Mary Maslowski, aye. Alan Peterson. Alan Peterson, aye. Arthur Rouse. Arthur Rouse, aye. And poor Bill isn't here. Thank you all for a great meeting. Thank you, Charlene. We will see you, I think it's on the 19th, right? 19th, Thursday the 19th is your next meeting. Packets are online and your paper packets went out in the mail today. Thank you so much, Charlene. All 95 pages. <laughs> Good, night. Good night, everybody. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Right. This conference is no longer being recorded.